What is the relationship between your brain and your conscious experiences? This is the fundamental question of the work of Donald Hoffman, a professor of computer science and cognitive science at UC Irvine. When Hoffman was a child, he wondered whether there was a cognitive dividing line between humans and machines, and that curiosity has driven him to his current work, building a mathematical framework for which we can use to model human consciousness. Humans would like to believe that evolution selects for traits that allow us to understand the world as it is. From his experimental simulations, Hoffman has shown the opposite, that evolution pushes us towards a mistaken version of reality. For listeners who are interested in theories about whether we live in a simulation, this episode is for you. If you are skeptical of the simulation theory, then this episode will also be useful for you because Hoffman gives one of the most nuanced and comprehensive explanations of reality that I have heard. I really think you'll like this episode with Donald Hoffman. To understand how your application is performing, you need visibility into your database. Vivid Cortex provides database monitoring for MySQL, Postgres, Redis, MongoDB, and Amazon Aurora. Database uptime, efficiency, and performance can all be measured using Vivid Cortex. Don't let your database be a black box. Drill down into the metrics of your database with one second granularity. Database monitoring allows engineering teams to solve problems faster and ship better code. Vivid Cortex uses patented algorithms to analyze and surface relevant insights so users can be proactive and fix performance problems before customers are impacted. If you have a database that you would like to monitor more closely, check out vividcortex.com slash sedaily to learn more. GitHub, DigitalOcean, and Yelp all use Vivid Cortex to understand database performance. At vividcortex.com slash sedaily, you can learn more about how Vivid Cortex works. Thanks to Vivid Cortex for being a new sponsor of Software Engineering Daily, and check it out at vividcortex.com slash sedaily. Donald Hoffman is a professor of cognitive science at UC Irvine. Donald, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Thank you very much, Jeff. Good to be with you. You are taking a mathematical approach to understanding consciousness. Why does the nature of consciousness interest you? I've been interested in consciousness since my teen years. I was interested both from uh, the point of view of science, where it looked like science was saying we're machines, and from the point of religion, where religion says we're not. And so, as a teenager, I thought this was quite interesting that uh, the two big influences on my life were at odds, and so I wanted to really understand what is the nature of consciousness and what is the, what is human nature, what what kind of creatures are we. So that, that started me uh, on this whole process. And how do you define that term, consciousness? Some people think about consciousness as being uh, something very sophisticated, where you have to be self-aware and aware that you're aware and so forth. But the for me, the interesting problems of consciousness come much earlier. The, the problem comes in simple perceptions, like the taste of garlic or the smell of a rose, perceptions that we might expect, uh, you know, a rat to have. And so, the, for me, the, the interesting problems of consciousness and, you know, how is consciousness related to the activity of our brain are right there in very, very simple conscious experiences in everyday life. So, it's, so that's the, the kind of consciousness that I'm interested in primarily, although, of course, self-awareness, you know, comes on later on. And we'll build up to talking about consciousness and its relationship to the nature of reality. But I want to talk a little bit about your approach to understanding consciousness, particularly this mathematical structure that you define for consciousness. Can you explain that mathematical structure and why it's useful to have a model for consciousness? Yes. So the reason that we would like to have a mathematical model of consciousness is that philosophers and, and, and others have been thinking about consciousness for centuries, actually for thousands of years. And we've been not really making a lot of progress. We've been spinning around in circles and and my goal was to turn the issues into a science where we could actually start to get mathematically precise models 
um, so that we could make progress. The, you know, my expectation was not that my first model would be correct. It, chances of that are very, very small. But at least my model would be precise so that others could tell me why precisely I'm wrong. And we could then start to fix the model and and you know move on. So in other words, I wanted finally to have a theory of consciousness that was dignified enough to be wrong because it was precise enough to be precisely wrong. So, so that's the, the reason why to have a mathematical model of consciousness. The the particular model that that I have developed suggests you know, I, I try to keep it as simple as possible. Um, you could of course throw in as many bells and whistles as you wanted to, but that the the scientific approach to these kinds of things is to make your mathematical foundation as absolutely spare as possible. Only stick in mathematical structures that you absolutely have to have. Um, and so mine is very, very spare. It's a, you can write it down on the back of a napkin. It's, it's that simple. Um, and the idea then is that using this mathematical structure, uh, it, it can create all the complexity that you would want in any, uh, anything that you would call a conscious experience or, or conscious, uh, self-awareness. And so if you'd like, I can say a little bit about the structure itself. Absolutely. Well, I've heard you talk a little bit about it, and I think it has uh, kind of components of a Markov model and some. some can, can you? Yeah, please do describe it. Yes. So, so the the key intuitions are that we have perceptions. So you know, the state of the world affects our conscious experiences. So there's some mapping from the world. You know, as as the world changes state, uh, my perceptions will change state. And so that, that mapping turns out the, is best modeled by something called a Markovian kernel. And all that all the Markovian kernel does is it says for each state of the world, what is the probability for how my experience, my perceptions will change based on that state? So it's, it's um, for those who are mathematically inclined, a Markovian kernel can, you can, be, it can be thought of in the finite case as a matrix uh, that is a so-called stochastic matrix. Each row of the matrix has values that sum to one. Mm. But more generally, it's it's uh, it is just for each state of the world, you get a probability measure on how your perceptions, your experiences, will change. Mm. So that's the first part. Then once you have you know, an experience, you need to decide how to act. And so you have a repertoire of actions and again another Markovian kernel that says for each experience that you have uh, what is the probability for how you will change your choice of action so that's what I call the decision kernel and then for each action that you end up choosing um, you will by acting change the state of the world so so again you have a Markovian kernel that says for each action I choose or each action that I do um, it, it describes how the state of the world will change. And so you get this loop from, say, if, from the world to my perceptions, there's a kernel. So I let's, you know, call it the kernel, the perception kernel P, and call the world W and my experiences X. So there's a map from the world W to my experiences X, and that map is a perception map that I call P. And then from my experiences to my actions, there's a kernel D. So, you know, and then then from my actions up to the world, back, uh, you know, I, can, I have another map that, uh, you know, is a Markovian kernel as well. So I get this triangle, uh, a looping triangle where the world affects my perceptions, my perceptions do affect my actions, my actions then affect the world, and it keeps looping around. Uh, so it's all Markovian kernels. All, the, all, all these movements are done by Markovian kernels, and the world, uh, my experiences, and my set of actions are mathematically modeled as so-called measurable spaces, probability spaces, if you will. That that makes a lot of sense to me. And I also appreciate the model of going for a spare presentation of what the what you're trying to do mathematically or what you're trying to display mathematically. And I think there's obviously a parallel to the idea of a Turing machine, which is such a simplistic model and yet describes thoroughly what a computer does. Uh, you talk about the practicality of the church 
Turing thesis, which is also involves Alan Turing. How does that relate to your own work? Or explain what the Church Turing thesis is and, and how that ap- applies to your work. Y- yes, I was in some sense uh, inspired um, and guided by Turing's work. He has uh, a theory of computation. And if you think about it, that's pretty impressive. I mean, there's lots of things you could compute, you know, the, the digits of pi, the traveling salesman. There's a lot of different computations. How, how could you give a, you know, a theory of computation? Well, Turing <laughs> wrote down uh, uh, this beautiful, simple formalism. It has only five or six components. You can write them down on the back of a napkin as well, uh, back of an envelope. And, and that, that simple formalism, which we now call a Turing machine, it turns out, uh, you know, it's a hypothesis, uh, a thesis that's never been disproven, and, and most computer scientists believe it, that any effective procedure, any computation, could be instantiated by some Turing machine. So this this simple notation, the simple uh, you know mathematical formulation that that Church uh, that that Turing wrote down uh, is really quite powerful, and part of the power is its simplicity. It lets you really see what's going on in computation quite clearly. So I wanted to do the same thing for consciousness and for for our perceptual experiences. Is there some formal structure, a very simple formal structure that um, is true of every perceptual experience? You know, we we have visual experiences and touch and taste and smell. There's an infinite variety. Other organisms have different modalities that we don't have, like infrared perception and so forth. So is there some formalism that could you know, be the unifying formalism for conscious experiences in the same way that the, you know, Turing's machine is a unifying formalism for computation. And so I, I took on the, you know, the, the task of trying to come up with such a formalism and I, and I just described, you know, the, that, that formalism you know, a moment ago. The, what it does, for example, it, it does not have an explicit memory. It does not have an explicit notion of, of attention in it. And so what, one, one task of the formalism is to show that that simple formalism that doesn't have an explicit memory or explicit notion of attention can build, we can build up circuits out of it that do memory and, and do attention. And we've just done that. So we've been, we have a paper under review right now that, that does just that. So the idea, we could have, of course, said, okay, now here's a little memory bank and here's an attentional filter and, and put all these bells and whistles into the formalism. But I would, you know, I would rather not put it into the formalism. I'd rather have a simpler formalism uh, be used that we could then use to build memory circuits and build attention circuits. And that's, and that's what we've done. One Absolutely. Other, one other thing I just mentioned is that um, now that we have this formalism for consciousness, we can compare it with Turing's formalism for computation. And that allows us to address the question, is consciousness the same thing as computation? And, and the formalisms are, are different in very interesting ways. So hmm. um, it's not the case that uh, conscious experiences are identical to computations. Can you elaborate on that? Yes. So conscious experiences, um, now one, one thing that I should say is that one can prove that the formalism that I wrote down for conscious experiences is computationally universal in the same sense that, that a Turing machine uh, is, is universal. And anything that can be computed can be computed with a Turing machine. Well, it turns out that you can use conscious agents, as I call this formalism, um, to build circuits that can also perform any computation that could be performed by a Turing machine. So in that sense, um, there is a there is a relationship. Anything that can be computed with a Turing machine can be computed by networks of conscious agents. But but the formal structure of conscious agents um, with these Markovian kernel, uh, three Markovian kernels uh, and three measurable spaces is a different structure than um, than the Turing machine. So it's different in that way. But then there there's still another issue, and that is uh, some researchers want to claim that conscious experiences just are identical to certain computational properties of systems. So they, they want to say that there are physical systems uh, like computers or, or, or brains with neurons that have certain computational properties uh, and that conscious experiences are identical to those computational properties. 
to those functions. And so this is called reductive functionalism uh, among philosophers, it, it, that, that conscious experiences are identical to functional properties. And so it turns out that um, one can prove, and, I, and I, I published a paper 10 years ago now, where I proved that reductive functionalism is false. Um, so one cannot identify conscious experiences with um, computational functions. However, I did not disprove uh, a weaker concept, which is the concept that um, conscious experiences could somehow emerge from or be caused by um, functional properties of a computer. So if somebody ever came up with a theory, uh, a scientific theory, that um, said that here's exactly how um, conscious experiences arise from or are caused by the functional properties of computers or, or systems of neurons. Um, I mean, my theorem didn't rule that out. That wouldn't but, surprise you. Um, well, um, I think it would surprise me if they could do it because I think that assumption is actually false. Couchbase is a NoSQL database that powers digital businesses. Developers around the world choose Couchbase for its advantages in data model flexibility, elastic scalability, performance, and 24 by 365 availability to build enterprise web, mobile, and IoT applications. The Couchbase platform includes Couchbase, Couchbase Lite, which is the first mobile NoSQL database, and Couchbase Sync Gateway. Couchbase is designed for global deployments with configurable cross data center replication to increase data locality and availability. Running Couchbase in containers on Docker, Kubernetes, Mesos, or Red Hat OpenShift is easy, and at developer.couchbase.com, you can find tutorials on how to build out your Couchbase deployment. All Couchbase products are open source projects. Couchbase customers include industry leaders like AOL, Amadeus, AT&T, Cisco, Comcast, Concur, Disney, Dixons, eBay, General Electric, Marriott, Neiman Marcus, PayPal, Ryanair, Rakuten slash Viber, Tesco, Verizon, Wells Fargo, as well as hundreds of other household names. Thanks to Couchbase for being a new sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. We really appreciate it. The fundamental question of your work, if we zoom out, is what is the relationship between the brain and your conscious experiences? When we look to biology and chemistry for the answer to the question, what are the best answers that biology and chemistry give us today? Most researchers who are doing this, and, and there are many, assume that it's some properties of neural activity of the brain that is either identical to or somehow gives rise to our conscious experiences. And then the debate is about what those properties of neural systems are. So one property might be, and this is um, Roger Penrose and Stuart Hamroff, they think that certain quantum properties of microtubules uh, within neurons and the way these these um, microtubules uh, undergo changes in their quantum state, uh, a collapse of their quantum state, somehow causes conscious experiences. Um, they don't, they're not able to explain how it does it, and they're not able to explain which quantum tubule collapses create my experience of chocolate and which create my experience of the smell of a rose. They have no idea how to do that. So, so they're at this point just speculating that there might be some relationship between microtubule properties and, and conscious experiences, but there's no real scientific theory in place yet about how that could be. There's nothing to really, you know, falsify it that way. Then there's another approach that says that it's more about the dynamics of systems of neurons as a system, right? They, you can view them um, as an information processing system. And so Giulio Tononi and Christoph Koch and others have been looking at what's called integration information theory, the idea that um, if, if systems of neurons implement a causal 
computational structure that has certain information properties that it, it integrates information uh, in, in a certain way, then um, they claim that your conscious experiences will be identical to that specific physical causal structure. Now they, you know, I had talked with Julio just a few weeks ago at a conference and asked him, has he been able to come up with a specific conscious experience like the taste of chocolate where he's been able to write down this <laughs> causal physical structure that would give rise to it and he, he cannot he there is not a single conscious experience that they can give a theory for so it's it's still an idea in hope of a theory and when I asked them about you know recent advances in quantum computation where you can create systems where you superpose causal structure where you have you know gate A followed by gate B uh, superposed with gate B followed by gate A, so there is no causal structure. And it turns out you get better computational efficiency if you let go of causal structure. Um, hmm. So I asked them, okay, you're, you're saying that consciousness is identical to the causal structure, but we now know that sticking to a causal structure actually forces you to be inefficient. So are you saying that consciousness is forced, uh, is, is, is only possible in these inefficient systems, and we know that there are better ones? Uh, so how can you take your theory into this quantum realm? And they cannot. They they admit that um, there's no way to extend the theory to the quantum realm. And they have no specific theory yet of any specific conscious experience. So that's, that's the kind of situation where we're in where everybody assumes um, that brain activity of some kind causes our conscious experiences and no one yet has any idea how to make that into a real scientific theory that's falsifiable. Right. So this is this is getting to your suggestion that evolution does not necessarily push us towards accurate perceptions of the world. That's right. The, the, the it may be intuitive that oh an accurate perception of the world or the universe would be beneficial to us, but you argue that it is actually not necessarily beneficial like or maybe there's like a point of diminishing returns or just a point where you need to get to where understanding some reality may be beneficial um, or that even that would probably be too generous um, uh, of a claim for you so when why why isn't it true why why is it not true that we would benefit evolutionarily from having an accurate perception of the world Right, and, and I'll just mention why, you might, for some people, this might seem like a leap. We were just talking about consciousness and neurons and so forth. All of a sudden, we're saying you know, something completely different, that we don't see reality as it is. Why, why the big disconnect? And the reason for this jump is that uh, uh, it, uh, it occurred to me that the reason we think that neurons create consciousness is because we believe neurons are there when we don't look. And that's because, and we believe that because we see, you know, we see a space-time world of objects in space and time. And that's the way we see the world, and we assume that we see the truth. So neurons are really there when you don't look. The table and chair are really there when you don't look because you're seeing the truth as it really is. So that was the assumption I began to question. I was, I was going, you know, look, we've been trying to start with neurons and get consciousness, and we can't do it. So maybe we've made a bad assumption here somewhere. So maybe the assumption that um, we see reality as it is and that physical objects exist when we don't look, maybe that's the assumption that we've we, we've gotten wrong. So I decided to to check and our best theory that, to test this is the theory of evolution. If, if we assume that our perceptions evolved by natural selection, uh, it turns out we can use the tools of evolutionary game theory to answer this very, very precise question. Does natural selection favor organisms that see the truth, that see reality as it is? And the answer is, is uh, we now have a theorem, and the answer is just flat out no. Um, the, the probability that an organism of our complexity evolved to see reality as it is, is, is zero. And, and the more complex the organism, the more complex the world, the lower the probability that natural selection would, would ever lead to um, organisms that see the truth. And, and I can give you, I mean, you, you, that probably is very counterintuitive, I can just give you a, a couple intuitions about why that might be the case. Think about someone playing a video game. 
uh, and you're you're you know playing a game where you have to you know, run through obstacles and get points to stay alive and get to the next level. Well, so as you're doing that, um, the, you have this visual interface that you're using. It could be a 3D holographic interface or a 2D interface, and and you're you're busy using that interface to to do what you need to do to grab the points that you need to grab to stay alive and get to the next level of the game. Now, if someone forced you to look at the, the real computer that you're dealing with, the diodes and resistors, the megabytes of software, the voltages, the magnetic fields, and they said, you know what, to, to, to play this game, I'm going to force you to toggle those voltage, voltages and play with those magnetic fields to make your moves. Well, good luck. I mean, being close to the truth of the computer is going to make sure that you can't solve you know, the problem of staying alive in the game. So what what happens is um, you're, you're given an interface, you know, the, the nice, simple visual interface of the game hides the truth of the computer, all the diodes and resistors and voltages. It hides all that and it gives you the eye candy you need to, you know, move the joystick or press the space bar, whatever it is that you're using on the computer to, to, to play the game. So it guides your actions. And so so the idea is that that knowing the truth um, is both too complicated and unnecessary to do what you need to do. So you, we see that in video games. We see it just on your desktop when you're you know, working on your computer. If you have an icon for like an email that you're editing and the icon for that email is blue and rectangular and in the middle of your desktop screen, that doesn't mean that the email itself in your computer is blue and rectangular and in the middle of you know, of your laptop you know, that anybody who thought that you know, it, you know is making a silly mistake the the whole point of the desktop interface is not to show you the truth of the computer you know the diodes and resistors and voltages it's there to hide that truth because you don't need it and it's in fact in the way and it gives you eye candy that lets you do what you need to do it guides your behaviors so that you can do what you need to do and effectively use the reality of the computer when you're completely ignorant of the reality of the computer. You don't need to know about diodes and resistors to, to do this. So that's what evolution has done for us. It has evolved our perceptions to be a user interface that's really dumbed down. It really dumbs down. It hides reality. I mean, the whole point of the interface, in part, is to hide reality. So our perceptions have been evolved by by evolution to hide the reality and to give us just the eye candy we need to do the adaptive actions we need in our niche. So to put it very concretely, space and time, as we perceive them right now around us, you know, in your room, um, is the desktop. And physical objects like tables and chairs and apples and trees, those are icons in your desktop. And space-time itself is not reality, it's just a species-specific desktop, and physical objects aren't an objective reality, they're just the icons on our desktop. And it's all there to keep us alive and to hide the truth. Now, what intuitions does that conclusion lead us to about what the nature of reality actually is? Because all that tells us is what what abstractions have been laid on top of reality that that we can perceive given our evolutionary tendencies it seems like if you come to that conclusion we can draw no conclusion about what the nature of reality really is that's right so the theory that we all intuitively believe is that reality is like what we see we see in 3d space and time and we see physical objects with shapes and colors and textures. So that's the nature of reality. Well, it turns out that theory is false. <laughs> if evolution is correct, then that theory is just plain false. So now the question is, what theory can we use to replace that? Some people have said to me, well, you know, you've, you've proven that science isn't possible. N not at all. I've, I've just proven that a particular theory that we like is, is false. But science goes on. We can still propose other theories about the nature of reality and how that reality then causes us to experience space and time and physical objects, which is just our interface. 
So, so we're, we're free to continue to theorize about the nature of reality and how it affects our perceptions so that we can do experiments. So, so the way I proceeded then so this was This is like a say, liberalism. You're, you're promoting basically a liberalism. Like we don't know anything, so we should be liberal about what we are willing to explore and consider. Yes, we should be absolutely creative in our ideas about the nature of reality, so liberal in that sense, but then we should be extremely rigorous. So we we should take those ideas um, and make them mathematically precise so that everybody can try to prove us wrong. So the goal is to come up with a, a new precise account of what reality is claimed to be so that others can then prove that account to be wrong. Uh, or, or try to prove it wrong. So, so I'm liberal. Oh, yes, you're free with the ideas, but then once you've got the idea, make it as precise as possible so you can be shown precisely why you're wrong. And that's how we make progress. Absolutely. And I think, you know, the way of doing this without driving yourself insane is you talk about the difference between taking the world literally and taking the real world seriously. Um, the difference being that if you take the real world uh, seriously, you're not going to jump off a cliff because you're going to take the cliff seriously. But you don't take the cliff literally in the sense that, oh, you know, based on my observation and my understanding of science that this cliff is, uh, you know, mound of sandstone, uh, 1800 feet above the ground uh, like I'm, I'm not actually going to believe that that's the case but I'm like literally but I'm going to take it seriously I'm going to take that representation of reality seriously and the potential consequences that it may have on uh, my consciousness in terms of the on or off switch of that consciousness a absolutely that's you've, you've put it quite well I, I, one of the objections that people have given to me about this approach is they, they say well you know Hoffman, if you you know think that train coming down the track at 200 miles an hour is just an icon of your desktop interface, why don't you step in front of it? And after you're gone and your theory with you, we'll we'll know that uh, you know there was much more to that train than just being an icon. It's it's really there, and it really did kill you. And 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 my added, my re reply is, is as you said, um, I wouldn't step in front of the train for the same reason that I wouldn't take a blue icon. Say you know I've been I've been writing an email or writing a paper, and it's, the blue icon for that is on my desktop. I wouldn't carelessly drag that icon to the trash can, uh, not uh, not because I take the icon literally. You know the file is not literally blue and it's not literally rectangular, but I do take it seriously. If I if I am careless with that icon, I could lose a lot of work. And so, and on our own computers, we we know that we have to take our icons seriously. But we don't take them literally. So, you know, this is not some kind of abstract logic chopping and, you know, s you know, s silly parsing of things in weird ways. This is something we do every day when we use our computers. We take the icons very seriously. You could lose your data if you're, if you're not careful with the icons. But none of us is, is foolish enough to take them literally. Nothing in the computer is literally blue and rectangular. So this is the kind of distinction that we just take for granted in our computers. And what I'm saying is we need to realize that the same distinction holds for everyday life. Yeah, if I see a snake, um, it's an icon of my desktop. Um, it's not an objective reality, but I better take it literally. I'm, I'm sorry, better not take it literally, but I better take it seriously. Don't touch that snake. Just like I shouldn't take the icon and drag it to the trash. Bad things happen. But the snake isn't any more literal than the blue rectangular icon is literal. Now, I want to take this conversation in a different direction for a bit. But uh, we'll come back to the discussion of the nature of reality. But one interesting consequence that I was thinking about in considering your work is that you're describing the animal intelligence, or at least human intelligence, as kind of unglamorous because it has, certainly has some holes in how accurate it is it's it's only good enough to get us to where we are today as homo sapiens uh, like and it and like that's all you need in terms of the benchmarking of how good it is at perceiving reality and having a clear explanation for what our reality is it's only just good enough and this makes me think about how we're 
you know, today we're crafting these artificial intelligences with these blunt instruments of neural networks. And the AI that we're developing today has tremendous gaps in what it's capable of doing. It's just like, it's not comprehensive. It's not, quote, generally intelligent. But yet what I take away from your work is that as humans, we were able to develop something that we have the audacity to call general intelligence, despite the fact that we have fundamental errors in how we perceive the world. There's things we're absolutely wrong about in how we perceive the world that we think we're right about. So it seems plausible that we could build artificial intelligence that would also qualify as being generally intelligent despite that artificial intelligence having its own fundamental errors in perception. I'm wondering what you think about that hypothesis. It's pretty interesting in the following sense. I First, I agree with you that um, our, our own intelligence is very, very specific to specific problems that uh, we evolved to solve. We, th- we tend to think of ourselves as very generally intelligent, but, but really what's going on is that we're just simply blind to our own blindnesses. We, you know, we're areas where we don't have abilities. We, we just are not aware of them. Um, other organisms that had different uh, strengths and weaknesses could look at us and, like, we look at, say, an ant, and we realize certain things the ant can't do uh, that that looks silly to us because you know we our intelligence differs from it. So we have a very specific kind of intelligence. And and by the way, you know, this is more deflation. Uh, our brains are shrinking. It's very very clear. Uh, from the uh, evidence of, of, of you know fossils and and also from paleontology that um, that our brains have shrunk about they, we've lost about the volume of a tennis ball in just the last twenty thousand years so our brains are in free fall uh, in terms of volume very it's it's quite remarkable so we're we're not the species that's getting ever bigger brains and ever more intelligent in fact. Uh, we're the species right now that is perhaps losing brain volume at the greatest rate of any species on the planet. Um, so, so evolution. Well, well, I mean, not to interrupt, but <laughs> I think it's kind of debatable, like what what the qualitative effect that actually has, because you could argue that oh, maybe it's getting more compact. It's you know the the neurons are have less latency to interact with each other because it's a smaller format. We don't really know if that's a, a qualitative difference. Well, it's, I mean, that's a fair point. It's, um, and also the bodies are, bodies are not as big as they were um, 20,000 years ago. But when you, um, and, and so, you know, it's the brain volume to body volume, the, the so-called encephalization quotient, that's really more important than just the absolute volume. I mean, an elephant has a much bigger volume brain than us, but it has a much bigger body to control. So it's really the, it's the encephalization quotient where we actually beat the elephant still. Um, but it turns out that our encephalization quotient has been declining as well over the last 20,000 years. So on that more objective measure of our abilities. Now, one could try to argue that perhaps we've gotten better wiring or something like that. Uh, that that's, an, that's interesting speculation. My guess is not. My guess is that... Um, it, 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 even before I saw the the research, it was it, the anthropologist John Hawkes is the one who who you know discovered this with the the fossil evidence. But using evolutionary psychology, even before I found out about Hawkes' work, I sort of had predicted this was the case because we used to be hunter gatherers, and so you were on your own or with a very small group, and you to survive, you pretty much had to have all the skills yourself. So if, if evolution is a very very brutal um, a learning algorithm. If you don't get it right, you die. And so we, we just died horribly unless we had really, you know, only those who were really, really bright because we were the sort of, our, our, our niche was to just be a, you know, you know, adaptive in a wide variety of, of complex situations. So we had to be somewhat clever. But now with agriculture and we started to, you know, get social networks where we gathered together and we started to get specialization. I didn't have to do everything myself. Someone else could do it. And so as a result, the safety net of society reduced the selection pressures on the individuals. And when the selection pressures go down, then the evolution changes. We changed our niche. And as a result, you didn't have to be as smart 
to stay alive, and so we're not as smart. <laughs> so the what is the pressure that that makes our, what would make our brains shrink? Like it's it's if you don't need it, then it's too expensive, right? So anything that you don't ah. need, it, right? The, everything it, evolution does everything on the cheap because brains, our brains right now use twenty percent of our oxygen and twenty percent of our energy. They're pigs. They're only three percent, four percent of our of our mass. But they're, you know, 20%. So they're very, very expensive. Anything that we can do to avoid having to spend those calories will make you more fit. And so smaller brains make you more fit. <laughs> um, it's, it's in, in a social situation. So we're actually, with our social network, it's more fit for our species to have smaller brains and less intelligence because it's not needed. We don't need okay, so, big brains. So, so, so this is interesting. I, I but I really want to reconfigure sure. our conversation. I, I would really lo love to hear your thoughts on the artificial intelligence yes, right. discussion. So, so I think that I think that artificial intelligence is um, the first thing to note is that an artificial intelligence is not limited by the intelligence of its creator. So, I mean, artificial intelligences can easily evolve. Um, to be a lot smarter than the people who program them, and and that's we're seeing that in you know AlphaGo and and you know Deep Blue you know with 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 chess and so forth, but it's 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 everywhere. So artificial intelligence can easily evolve and is evolving to run way past the the creators of artificial intelligence. Do you have any predictions for where we're going to get the? Because so I so I think. You know, one of the things we've touched on here is there's basically the line between general intelligence and narrow intelligence is kind of a false dichotomy. But there is the question of where is the narrow intelligence domain that evolves into the general intelligence domain? Well, I think that uh, in some sense, we'll never have a completely general intelligence, right? There's always... The, the number of things that you could know and, and could be expert at is, is infinite, um, and any real system will always be finite. But, but there is, I would say, whereas humans, we're limited by, you know, we have, you know, 80 billion neurons or, or so, um, and we have a certain number of synapses. We have certain limits that uh, mean that we can't really do anything much better beyond a certain limit. Whereas the artificial intelligences, they're not going to be limited by the resource limits that we have, the computational limits that we have, or even the conceptual limits. They can evolve uh, effectively anywhere in, in the space of concepts and, and intelligences. So in that sense, they're, they're, they're far more general than we are. Any specific AI will, of course, not be a general intelligence. But the, the set of all AIs, as they evolve and compete with each other, um, there's no in principle limit to the kinds of intelligence they could explore. So they are in that sense general intelligences. And I have no doubt that um, if, if things, if we don't blow ourselves up and so forth, if, if humans and AIs continue to evolve for the next few decades, um, the best artists, the best novelists, the best writers of, of you know operas will all be AIs, and no yeah. human will be able to touch them. It's absolutely it's quite, quite clear to me. It's yeah, and I and I agree with that. And it's interesting because I have this Google Home, and I talk to it, and it gives me answers. And you know, I think about it, I'm like this thing has it has voice recognition. It has. Uh, robust processing capability and query response and uh, there's really not much left separating it from something that uh, i mean i think it already qualifies as generally intelligent to me like it surprises me all the time with the questions it can answer uh, absolutely um, no i i agree that and it, the, i some people are afraid of this i'm i'm pretty excited about it it's going to be fun to have an ai that i can just simply um ask any question and, and have it teach me. And and the nice thing about it is the AI will be able to ask me a couple questions. It'll find out 
what I know and what I don't know, and what it needs to say to help me with my own limited capacities to understand what it already knows. So it'll be a Absolutely. great teacher. So it's, yes. it's it's a great, great thing that's coming our way. And I'm looking forward to all the novels and then poetry and, and art and operas that will be written by AIs that no human could ever come up with that that we can enjoy and then of course the ais will be writing stuff that is simply beyond us that will be like monkeys at mozart <laughs> right i mean they'll they'll so i mean well they but then maybe they'll know what mutations we need maybe they'll know so here's you know hoffman has a g here if he if he just had a cat instead of that one g then he could understand this new piece of literature that i so so then maybe they can it could create a virus that could you know change my dna and i could then you know, change my brain that I could e- appreciate the new literature that they've written. That would be fun. for sure if they are so charitable. <laughs> if they are, that's the issue. <laughs> Encapsula is a cloud service that protects applications from attackers and improves performance. Encapsula sits between customer requests and your servers, and it filters traffic, preventing it from ever reaching your servers. Botnets and denial-of-service attacks are recognized by Encapsula and blocked. This protects your API servers and your microservices from responding to unwanted requests. To try Encapsula, go to Encapsula.com slash SE Daily and get a month free for Software Engineering Daily listeners. Encapsula's API gives you control over the security and performance of your application. Whether you have a complex microservices architecture or a WordPress site, Encapsula has a global network of 30 data centers that optimize routing and cache your content. The same network of data centers that are filtering your content for attackers are operating as a CDN and speeding up your application. To try Encapsula today, go to Encapsula.com slash SE Daily and check it out. Thanks to Encapsula for being a new sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. I want to get back to the to the reality question because this is really your bread and butter. And uh, you know, I've there are several guests who come on Software Engineering Daily, and I ask them the question like, "Do you think we're living in a simulation?" and you know the simulation question. It maybe it's not a great question. Maybe it's, uh, I don't know. But it's it's a th- it's a thought provoking question. And, and um, Stephen Wolfram came on the show, and I asked him that question because I was like, okay, here's a deep thinker. He's probably thought about these type of things. He probably has his own unique thoughts. The first thing he said was that that's a poorly formed question. I was like, well, that hurts coming from Stephen Wolfram, but. He went on to give actually a great answer, which and 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 it made me think about it. like maybe there is some truth to that. Like it was kind of a poorly formed question, and what I'm wondering is like what is the right way to phrase the question? What exactly are we asking here? What question are we asking about the substrate of reality when we come to the conclusion that okay, reality is not what it seems? We come to the c- conclusion that we need this this reality liberalism, yet we also have reality conservatism in the form that we're going to be very rigorous about how we digest the liberal reality theories that we come up with. But once we get to that framework, what is the question that we're asking? Well, the question is, what is the nature of the relationship between our perceptions and reality? Can we give a mathematically precise statement of that relationship of perception and reality? And the answer that most of my colleagues want to give is that our perceptions tell us the truth about reality. Not exhaustively, of course. No one thinks we see all of reality as it is. But that our perception of space, 3D space, is a true perception of an objective fact that would be true even if no human or no observers and no consciousness had ever existed. Uh, But it turns out that So I want to say that our perception of reality is just a user, uh, you know, desktop, a species-specific desktop. Now, you might say, well, the physicists, of course, could prove Hoffman wrong. Surely the physicists know that 3D space is real. Well, here's, here's an interesting thing that the physicists have discovered that will blow most people's minds. If I ask you, 
how much information could you cram into a volume of space? See, I have a sphere, like a, you know, a volleyball. And, I, I, and that's the, the amount of volume of space I have. And I say, how much data could you store in that inside that volleyball? Well, you might say, well, I could stick a you know a one terabyte hard drive in there, and then maybe with new technology, I could stick two of them in there. And maybe as we compactify the technology, we can get more and more terabytes in there. So the, the, here's the question: Is there some ultimate principled limit of physics? about how much information you could store in the volume. And we know the answer. Stephen Hawking discovered the answer. And the answer is the mathematical equation that he wrote down. And it turns out that the amount of information you can stick inside that sphere has nothing to do with the volume of the sphere. Nothing to do with the volume of the sphere. It, it's proportional only to the area. Now, let that sink in for a minute because it, it's going to destroy everything that most people believe about <laughs> space and time. I'll tell you, I'll just unpack it a little bit more. What this means is suppose I take that volleyball and I take six smaller spheres of equal size that just fit inside of it. So they can just pack inside that volleyball. You can do a little computation and you'll find that they have those six volleyball, those six little spheres together have about half the volume of the original volleyball. So they're about half the volume, but they have about 3% more surface area. That means that you can store more data in those six little spheres with half the volume than you can store in the big sphere with twice the volume. Now do this recursively again. Take each of those six spheres and pack inside them six smaller spheres and keep doing it a few times. Which you'll, if you do it, you know, say 20 times, you'll find that you've got now um, something that has a lot more volume than the original volleyball, but an infinitesimal, I'm sorry, a lot more area than the volleyball, yeah. but an infinitesimal volume. Interesting. And you can store more information in that infinitesimal volume than you can store in the much bigger volume. That's the universe we live in. And anybody's conception of the reality of space and time has to deal with, with what's called the holographic principle. I've been just describing the holographic principle. So now, I was not surprised by this. I'm, I'm thinking that space is simply um, a coding system that we evolved for information about fitness. Evolution is all about us learning about how to get fitness payoffs. That's what we need to stay alive. It's like playing a game. If you don't get the points in the game, if you do something else besides grab points in the game, you die and you don't get to the next level. Well, that's what our perceptions are all about. It. The evolution is a big fitness game, and our, our perception of space and time and objects is really just about where we can get the fitness points we need to stay alive uh, and have kids that will go to the next level of the game. Uh, and so, so I actually predicted that space itself is probably an error-correcting code for information about fitness. So I, I realized this just about a year ago. So I, I, because if, if our perceptions have been evolved by natural selection to communicate about fitness and we don't want to get fitness wrong, then we want to make sure that we have at least a little bit of error correction in our data about fitness. And so I predicted that space itself is an error correcting code. And so I went, I just I decided, well, okay, have the physicist sort of thinking about space as an error correcting code and it turns out they have just within the last couple of years physicists themselves have discovered that space time is an error correcting code it's a quantum secret sharing error correcting code and they can actually write down what the code is so it's so physics is converging with the arguments that i'm giving from evolutionary biology to say that we're, you know, space and time, which we thought was the framework of objective reality. Everything real happens in space and time. They're the objective reality. That turns out to be false. Space time is simply an error correcting code that a particular species uses to get information it needs to stay alive. Information about fitness. So it's a change in worldview. Have you come full circle to your questions? as a kid about the tensions between the scientific and the religious, have you reconciled those two sides of your identity? Yes. I, I think that I have an idea that we could evolve what I call a scientific spirituality. I think that both science and spirituality have 
some very good things to offer and some serious problems. So the good so the problem of of a lot of science right now has been its its assumption of physicalism that space time is a fundamental reality. The most many religions have not had that assumption. They've said there's something beyond space and time sure. that's the fundamental reality. So on that I think the religions uh, were right and and I think science was wrong. On the other hand, science has this incredibly powerful method of being absolutely precise in in your assumptions precise in, your, in mathematical theories, and then very vigorous in terms of experimental tests. So it has this incredible method. And religion has been hampered by dogmatism. We have these texts that have been around for thousands of years and that are venerated. And, and so instead of having a dynamic um, method where you try to show that you're wrong, you have instead groupthink where you try to prove that you are always right, that this doctor this you know this doc doctrine that's been around for thousands of years and this scripture that's been around for thousands of years is and always has been absolutely correct so i think here science has the upper hand the scientific method is the method of trying to falsify our beliefs make them precise and falsifiable and and to get rid of the dogmatism so if we can have a scientific spirituality where we let go of the physicalism and we keep the scientific method I think we could evolve actually a spirituality in which we begin to ask questions about meaning, human value, human emotions, human ethics. And, and instead of requiring our answers to be in accord with a doc, you know, a document that's 3000 years old, we can ask ourselves, uh, you know, we can get inspiration. I'm happy to get inspiration from the Bible, the Quran, you know, the, the Vedas, wherever I might be. I'm great to get inspiration there or from a glass of beer, wherever you can get the, the information, you know, the inspiration, get it, but then go to the scientific method to try to falsify the ideas that you've got, make them precise and then try to falsify them. I think that we could develop a scientific spirituality where we begin to really understand who we are and, and what is meaningful about us. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think, you know, one one example of that is um I think you're a fan of the movie The Matrix. Yes. Um and I think that movie is, you know, it's interesting because it's it's a movie that's beloved by scientists and yet mm-hmm. I think it's a religious allegory ultimately. Yes. Um and so it's it's just funny because that's like kind of an example of a great merger of spiritual questions along with scientific questions absolutely it it, it I, I like the way that it plays with reality and also brings in religious ideas but also the science it it really shows how these are all interacting and i think that it is pointing us to a future in which we can have a scientific mindset and and sensitively but rigorously address questions of human meaning and value. So I, 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 I see a bright future for a scientific spirituality, but it's going to be hard on bo- you know, for the scientists, on the one hand, to give up physicalism and for the religious to give up dogmatism. But I think once both sides make the concession, both will really gain a, a vibrant new scientific spirituality. Do you find the matrix a plausible explanation of reality? Um, well, the specifics about us being batteries that were designed by, <laughs> you know, of course, the specifics I think are they're they're fun, but of course they're 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 quite implausible. What makes that implausible? Well, there, there's from a scientific point of view, there's there's no um, compelling reason why I would. Want we're not to, good batteries. Yeah, we're not good batteries, for example, and and the whole story isn't isn't quite plausible. U- ultimately. I mean, even for my theory in which consciousness is fundamental, then I still need to to explain why. Why is there consciousness as opposed to nothing? And what is the fundamental reason for any conscious activity? I mean, what what is a fundamental principle that would would be at the core of of you know this whole thing having any point at all? Um, and so those are those are deep questions. I do have you know ideas about that. Um, actually, quite well worked out ideas, but those would be the kinds of ideas that you'd want to do rigorously and build a scientific spirituality, which would also then lead to a, 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 a principled understanding of this nature of this reality. So the matrix didn't offer a 
you know, a deeply principled, but it offered a really, you know, a mind blowing, you know, excursion into other realities. Great. Okay. Uh, Donald, this has been a great conversation. I want to thank you for coming on to Software Engineering Daily. We we obviously didn't talk much about software engineering. I <laughs> I, I think you you do in your your um your experiments are software simulations though, right? I mean, we could have talked about that hypothetically. Oh. Oh, absolutely. Uh, actually, I'm a professor of computer science at UC Irvine, and I was in the artificial... Oh, I thought it was cognitive science. Well, I, I, I'm both, cognitive science and computer science. So my primary wow, okay. is in cognitive science, but also in, in computer science, and I was in the AI lab at MIT, so... Okay, I had no idea about that qualification. I was just like, here's a cognitive scientist who is a hobbyist computer scientist, but I didn't realize it's uh, equal passions. Yeah. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. A lot of fun. Great. Well, uh, well, Don, thanks for coming on the show. It's been a great conversation. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. It was a pleasure. Listeners have asked how they can support software engineering daily. Please write us a review on iTunes or share your favorite episodes on Twitter and Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at software underscore daily or on our Facebook group called Software Engineering Daily. Please join our Slack channel and subscribe to our newsletter at softwareengineeringdaily.com. And you can always email me, jeff at softwareengineeringdaily.com if you're a listener and you want to give your feedback or your ideas for shows or your criticism. I'd love to hear from you. And of course, if you're interested in sponsoring Software Engineering Daily, please reach out. You can email me, jeff at softwareengineeringdaily.com. And thanks again for listening to this show. 